when I was 13 years old, when the testosterone reached my brain, um, and I developed acne and my first pubic hair, which I remember, which I regarded with great shock. I can still remember it. But I also developed a morbid self-interest, which most teenagers do, and the whole philosophical world expands, even though without wanting to be too chemically deterministic about this, this is all set off by testosterone. And I started keeping a diary. Um, uh, and I kept a diary pretty relentlessly for, for the next... Um, 11 years. Funny, 1963, of course, was the year of Philip Larkin, wasn't it? The, the year of the Beatles' first LP and Lady Chapley's lover. Um, anyway, by the age of 22, I was so embarrassed and ashamed about it, I had a sort of auto de fe and destroyed it all in the fire in the back garden of my parents' home, which I rather regret now because it'd be quite interesting to be able to go back to it and see just what a prune I was at that age before my before my frontal lobes is myelinated. There's lots of evidence that teenagers, the frontal lobes of the brain, which are the social, social, moral, behaving bits of the brain that aren't myelinated, they're not insulated. Myelin is the insulating material that insulates nerve fibers. So anyway, so diary writing was, was a part of my life and I then destroyed it all. It also, I think it'd be quite interesting if I could resurrect the ashes um, rather like Rossetti digging up his um, late wife's body when he got the poems out, he'd buried with her when, he, when she died. To, to also, because I suspect the sort of existential problems I'm facing now at the age of 65, having just resigned from, retired rather, or sort of resignation as well, from full-time NHS practice just two, three weeks ago, I suspect the existential problems that were haunting me as a teenager have come back to haunt me now in many ways, and the metaphysical wolf is, is back at the door. But I, I kept on writing a diary, not, not in great detail, until... 20 years ago, I went through a terribly painful and traumatic divorce, the details of which I'm not going to regale you with. Um, but my, the diary became a quite an important sort of therapeutic outlet for me. Um, and then, after the marriage had come to an end, um, I found I was writing more and more, mainly about my, my life at work, because the fact of the matter is, um, all medicine is terribly interesting, and if you do if you're at the sort of triple X extreme version of, neuro of medicine, which brain surgery is in many ways, because it's so bloody dangerous for the patients, um, it is extraordinarily interesting. And there is this strange dichotomy, this tension in one's life as a neurosurgeon, that for my patients, it's, uh, it's the most terrible experience of their life. And if you think about it, what could be worse, really, than being told, and I mainly specialize in brain tumor surgery, um, to be told that something's destroying your brain. And as educated people, you'd realize that means there's something destroying your very being, your very, your very essence. So whereas for my patients, it's the most awful, ghastly experience imaginable. And oddly enough, I speak from a sort of vicarious personal experience because my, my son had a brain tumor when he was for my first marriage, when he was a baby. And he survived, um, and he's, he's fine many years later. But I've been a little bit at the receiving end, and I'll come back to that question later. So as for my patients, it's the most ghastly experience, horrible beyond belief, and many of them die, many of them are left terribly disabled. For me, it's just another day at work. Um, you know, and in my outpatient clinics, I'll see 10 patients in a row, all with horrible brain tumors. And there is this strange sort of tension, it's this incredibly asymmetrical relationship between the doctor and the patient. But I always knew and felt very strongly that, that what I was doing as, as a neurosurgeon was extraordinarily interesting from all sorts of points of view. And I, I wanted to write about it, not, not to publish it, not for anything like that, just to write about it, to record. Because always I felt I was seeing all these extraordinary things, and again, going through intense inner, inner experiences myself. And I wanted to record it in some way. So I started writing, having recorded the traumas of divorce, which... I'm sure many people here are divorced, and the old cliche of moving house, death, and divorce are the most traumatic experiences in life. Um, it became a very, it, it came quite interesting, and I like to actually try to turn these very interesting experiences in, into something which read well and sounded well. And I then met my second wife, who's this um, ter terribly clever, witty writer called Kate Fox, who wrote this book called Watching the English. Um, I, I should warn you that I am, I should, that these are rules of English behavior of which self-deprecation and the false modesty rule is a very important rule, and I am used to illustrate that rule. But you'll have to buy the book if you want to know what I said <laughs> when, we, when we first met. 
anyway, and occasionally I, I would, I would um, read bits of my diary to Kate, and she says, oh, that could be a book, you know, go and see my agent. So I trotted along to see her agent. This is 10 years ago now. And he said, yes, well, you, you can write, but the problem people like you have is actually sort of structuring it and making it into a, into a coherent whole. So encouraged by this, I sort of struggled for years, <laughs> for many years, trying to turn these episodic stories into something a little bit more coherent. And my agent said, well, he saw it as, as, a, factual, as a factual thriller, which was, and in a sense, that's correct, because every, I go to work every day, um, or did, I, I'm continuing to work part-time, and I'll go on working overseas, so I haven't totally hung up my gloves yet, as, as the surgeons call it. Um, and every day is an adventure. If I'm operating, it's not at all clear what will happen. Um, and you, you, go, you see these very extraordinary things happening. And it also, as I wrote more about it, it became a sort of exploration of my own feelings and understanding uh, of the nature of being, of being a doctor. Because as I said earlier, it's a profoundly asymmetrical relationship between doctor and patient. The patient wants, wants a doctor, and I've been a patient myself, and members of my family have, um, and the patient wants that doctor to be totally devoted and uh, the, the, center of their, the center of their life. And yet, as a doctor, you're kind of wary of this commitment. You, you, you don't want to get too involved. You, you do, most doctors care for patients, but only up to a certain point. There is this profound um, tension again in, in, in medicine that the only ethic, obviously, is that you should treat patients only as you'd wish to be treated yourself or members of your family to be treated. But it's almost impossible to actually treat anybody you know closely. I did it once. Um, one of my daughter's um, godmother, who had a, a malignant brain tumor, it was a very simple operation, not really a biopsy. Um, and even that I found almost impossible because I was so anxious and so nervous. All my mechanisms of professional detachment had failed. So the, the, the problem with medicine, particularly dangerous medicine, is finding this balance between compassion and detachment. There's this sort of throwaway idea that surgeons are psychopaths. Well, I know, I, if you look at the bob hair checklist of psychopathy, a few things ring true, like an exaggerated self-belief and uh, things like that. But of course, if you think about it, you have to have that. And, and it's something I've only really, really realized in recent years that when, you become, when, you, when you're a medical student, you can be compassionate and caring and touchy-feely, as doctors dismissively call it, because you're not responsible for what happens to the patient. But then when you become a young doctor, you have to stop sticking needles into people. And it hurts, they flinch, and they, they know you're not much good at it. <laughs> and somebody else will be better, but you have to persist. So patients become objects of anxiety and almost dislike and threat, as much as recipients of our wonderful philanthropic compassion. And, and of course, so you have to gain as a patient um, with, a, with a young doctor, it's not very reassuring if, if um, the doctor says, well, I don't quite know what to do, or I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Uh, I remember when, when I was a medical, I went to the Royal Free of a London um, Hospital School for Medicine, for women, um, which has started taking a few eccentric men like me and other things first. And it was a great institution, and, and Sophia Jex Blake and Elizabeth Darrett Anderson were all had wards named after them. And we were sent off to Hitchin in Hertfordshire as medical students for obstetrics and to, de to deliver babies. I was great. I loved delivering babies. I almost became a gynecologist. I enjoyed it so much. I'm sure I'm glad I didn't. But, um, but in those days, I didn't quite know. I, I, this is 30, 35 years ago. And, and the women would often have episiotomies, a, a cut to allow the baby's head to come out. I suspect it's done less now than in the past. And then it was left to the medical students to stitch it up, which is a... No reflection of how there were any bad things about the way the NHS was around in the past, because actually stitching up the pisiotomy was going to have serious implications for the woman's sex life in the future. But anyway, the medical students did it. And I remember one of my colleagues, um, there the poor woman was in a lithotomy position, being stitched up, and the student said, oh dear, I've never done this before. <laughs> um, which of course went up like a lead balloon. So the moral of the story is, you learn to lie at an early age. You learn to act. You learn to pretend you have to. And of course, again, if you've read that wonderful book by Robert Trivers, the evolutionary anthropologist, the best way of lying to others is to deceive yourself. Self, so self-deceit 
is a very, very important medical well, skill, which we all have to develop to a certain extent. I mean, I'm serious, you have to. You have to believe in yourself. So the so-called sort of psychopathic arrogance of surgeons um, does reflect a, a psychological need to do this. If you're a genuine psychopath, um, and you didn't actually care what happened to patients, well, it wouldn't be very interesting because what actually makes surgery exciting is, in fact, your intense concern the patient should do well. If, if, if the patient is just uh, an object and you're a true psychopath and you have no empathy, well, it wouldn't really be very interesting. Um, so although you can get I mean, their degrees of psychopathic personality disorder, and I know one or two surgeons, not many, whom I think probably are slightly psychopathic. <laughs> but provided they're in private practice, all is well. Because um, you won't make much money in private practice on the whole if your patients do badly. So although I, I, I on the whole, am very critical of, of, of marketization and privatization of healthcare, so I've worked, uh, I've been a professor in America for many years. I know the American system very well. I've worked in other countries as well. And I think there's the present government side and the Labour government side here as well that privatisation is a good thing. I think it's, 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 it's largely a mistake. But having said that, um, you can see if, if surgeons were psychopaths, actually um, having a financial private system is very important because it's the only way to make sure they'll get good results. So, uh, again, as I was writing the book, I... I I start, the book starts talking about the more exciting triumphant aspect of neurosurgery. And it is immensely exciting, some of the operating one does. Um, and I became a neurosurgeon because I saw an aneurysm operation. It wasn't really because of my son's brain tumor. Um, and it was like sort of bomb disposal work, really bomb disposal work in the sense of cowards because it was a patient's life at risk. But it was very exquisite, very delicate surgery done with an operating microscope. And if you've ever looked on a really good pair of um, high-quality binoculars, you know how the world looks somehow more real than reality. There's a greater sense of depth and beauty. And it's the same using an operating microscope. And, and surgery, in many ways, is an addiction. And I haven't quite, although I'll still be doing some operating, and I was operating last week in, in Ukraine, um, I don't quite know how, I'm, how I'll whether I'll really miss it very much or not. I remember I was once in a... I have no interest in gambling at all. It doesn't touch me at all. But I was watching once people in a casino, watching the wheel go around the, the, the roulette wheel, the ball go around the roulette wheel. And it's the same intense living, living in the present. It's intense both in anxiety, presumably you may win or lose money, and living only for the moment, and everything else disappears and becomes very unimportant. And, and operating, even minor operating, is a little bit like that. So lots of doctors don't want to be surgeons. They don't like sticking knives into people. They don't have the sort of bloodlust almost that's required. Um, but as I said, it is, it is all predicated upon an intense concern your patient should do well. But it's only that the problem, of course, is there are only triumphs because there are failures. If, if everything was easy and straightforward, if, if clipping an aneurysm in the middle of the brain um, all that's been largely superseded now, that operation by technological changes. If it was easy and safe, it, it, it would be nothing special about it. So, of course, there's the other side of the coin, which is things go wrong. And again, one is a human being, and one makes mistakes. And you might say, well, why write a book which discusses this? And, and that's uh, no, another question. But anyway, two, two or three years ago, halfway through the book, I decided I ought to start trying to remember all my worst mistakes. Doctors like to talk behind closed doors about eminent professors on the point of retirement who actually stand up and talk about some of their worst mistakes. Um, and it was actually very difficult to remember them. Um, and I lay in bed every morning. I had to have a note notebook with me and a pen pencil. And if I didn't write them down immediately, I forgot them again, all over again. It was rather like stirring up methane in a stagnant pond. And the more I thought about it, and I've had a huge practice, it's very busy, I've oper I don't know how many thousands, tens of thousands of operations I've done. Um, and I'm sure I've forgotten some of my worst mistakes. And the problem is this, that these, some of these mistakes were not mistakes, well, it was a difficult case, it was a question of judgment, and, you know, I got it wrong, it's easy to be wise in retrospect. I, I've made careless mistakes. Um, and yet, you know, I like to think I care for my patients, and surely if I make a careless mistake, it means I'm a bad doctor. 
Um, and there's that nice book by the American surgeon Atul Gawande, who, I think the one called Complications, where he says the problem with medicine is it's not stopping bad doctors making mistakes, it's stopping good doctors making mistakes. And of course, we all make mistakes, it's, it's, it's normal. And that's how we learn, we learn by making mistakes. But the problem in medicine is, particularly in surgery, particularly in brain surgery, the consequences of one's mistakes are so terrible, many things are worse than death, um, that you really, it's very hard to face up to them and, until maybe towards, towards the end of your career. And then I came across this wonderful book, which for me is like a sort of Bible, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which basically says, as human beings, we are wired, we, we think we can think rationally, but we are, we are wired to make mistakes, we jump to conclusions. He uses the analogy of the famous Muller liar optical illusion, where you have two horizontal lines of the same length, and simply adding arrowheads, one pair pointing inwards, the other pointing outwards we see them as different lengths. And even though intellectually we know they're the same length, we cannot see that. And he and his late colleague Amos Tversky, and Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for this. He's a psychologist, but he got the Nobel Prize for economics. He showed we make similar mistakes in assessing information, particularly with, with assessing other people's qualities and abilities and assessing probability and risk. And of course, this is exactly what, as a surgeon, one is doing all the time. Or any operation, to state the obvious, is a question of balancing the risk of surgery against the risk of not operating. Um, and that involves, and often the, the information is pretty fuzzy and uncertain. And again, as a senior surgeon, a hugely important part of my work is training the next generation of surgeons. It's great torment, I mean, to watch to watch my juniors operating and having to decide at what point I take over is a million times worse than operating myself. But it's necessary, it has to be done. Um, there's no getting away from that. Surgeons don't spring fully armed out of Zeus's head like Athene. Um, and this, this Kahneman calls the halo effect. We often make errors. We like somebody for one quality. And then we tend to, or we dislike them. And then we think, well, they're good at doing everything else. And I have to make, and all surgeons, all senior surgeons, have to make decisions at what point you delegate an operation, how much of it you delegate. And you are biased. You are biased by whether you like or dislike the person. And you can't get away from these problems. You can at least be aware of them. Um, and I found Kahneman's book was really very consoling in a way. It made me feel well, I, am only, I am only human. And all these awful mistakes I've made over there. Sure, I've made lots of successful operations as well. But the whole point is you, you only learn by making mistakes. Um, you don't, success teaches you nothing. And on a similar note, which is something I'm thinking more about recently, because I can be mainly, I'm mainly interested in, I'm not so much teaching operating as teaching communication, is you never get feedback when you talk to patients. Uh, and in, in neurosurgery and brain tumors, a lot of the tumors are cancerous. Uh, a, a lot of the time I have to spend that wretched cliche breaking, breaking bad news. Um, but patients don't ring me up afterwards and say, Mr. Marsh, you, you, you told me very nicely I was going to die, or Mr. Marsh, you're a crap. How can you learn to do better when you never get any feedback? And this comes back to the, to the profoundly asymmetrical relationship of a doctor-patient relationship. So one of the things I'm hoping on do, in doing in, in, in my post-retirement role is, is trying to discuss these issues and maybe use video cameras and the like with, with my surgical trainees. Because we all think doctors ought to be able to communicate well, but it, it's something you learn. And you, get, you learn, ultimately you learn most from your own experience. Most healthcare is handed out in the hospitals by young doctors and young nurses who have no experience of illness personally. And I've learned most from my own illnesses, from my wife's illness, from my son's illness. And of course, this takes many, many years. So although I'm, I'm retired now, uh, sort of, uh, I think doctors rather like wine, or at least Bordeaux, get better with age. Thank you very much. Thank you.